So, um, as I was introduced, uh, I work at United Technologies Research Center. Um, uh, I actually do two jobs there. I mean, the first one is I lead the machine intelligence initiative, which is mostly research. And I also uh, act as a uh, principal investigator for data analytics projects for the business units, which is more about applying machine learning to the real products. So, uh, I mean, uh, that, the, the that I do in uh, deploying machine learning for the real applications is more fun. It's not that I don't like research, but uh, when you take these things to the product, uh, you see a lot of things that you don't see while you're doing research. So uh, the job that we have at United Technologies Research Center is to work closely with all our business units so that we can go back and forth quickly. So that said, uh, just to calibrate myself, how many of you know United Technologies? How do you know what? United Technologies? Okay, good. Uh, you might have used one of our products to get here. So <laughs> it's a $56 billion company. And uh, we are in the Fortune 100 companies, and I believe we rank 47. Uh, we have four main business units. And broadly speaking, we split them into two. Uh, the first two are aerospace, and the next two are uh, commercial, meaning building systems. So Pratt & Whitney, we actually build jet engines. We uh, maintain the jet engines. We, uh, we also do a lot of military applications. UTAS, we uh, have aerospace. We build and develop aerospace components and systems. And for example, like space suits, life support, uh, brakes for the aircrafts. Uh, Otis, Otis builds uh, elevators, escalators, and walkways. So Otis actually moves uh, um, close to uh, the equivalent of uh, world's uh, population in three days. So uh, that's a fun fact. But uh, the fourth one is climate control and security. Here it's a combination of close to 13 or 15 different business units, starting from uh, perimeter security, badge readers, uh, climate control, uh, even HVAC systems, uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, the most important thing is uh, the company called Lenel, which does uh, video surveillance too. So these are the four companies that uh, UTRC Research Center uh, uh, basically does research for. So the good thing about United Technologies is they invest a lot in R&D. So we have close to $4 billion being invested in research. So very quick overview of uh, the research center. So we are the research wing for all the businesses that UTC has. And uh, we are very proud about our diversity. Like we have people from 45 different countries. We have 60 plus employees worldwide. Um, most of them have advanced degrees. 68% uh, of, of us have doctorate degrees too. So that's a uh, brief history. Uh, the, f the head office is in East Hartford, uh, two hours drive from here. Uh, we uh, opened an office in U uh, Berkeley. Uh, we have uh, close to 15 people working there. We also have an office in uh, China, uh, Italy, and uh, Ireland Corp. So altogether, we are 600 researchers trying to solve the toughest problems that the business unit has. And our job is to make sure that our business units are never surprised uh, by their competitors. So we achieve this not on our own. Uh, we do a lot of collaboration. We work with universities. We work with uh, business units. Uh, we work with government agencies like DARPA. Uh, we also work with uh, national labs. And we work with other uh, private companies too. So that said, uh, today I want to uh, present two things. Uh, I just want to give you a view uh, overview on what kind of applications within aerospace and building systems that we try to solve using machine learning. And the second thing is, uh, the, can we just take off the shelf machine learning libraries and solve our problems? Or do we have to have our own research? So I'll try to answer this, that question as I go through the slides. So we have a huge team, uh, close to 10 to 15 people working on and off on this uh, uh, machine intelligence initiative. 
uh, we collaborate with other departments. We, uh, we also work with the human-machine uh, interaction team. Uh, so today we, are, we were supposed to be two speakers. Amit Surana couldn't make it, so I'll try to uh, cover his slides and do my best there. Uh, the good thing about the research center that I like most is uh, they let us publish whatever we do. So all the work that I'll be discussing in the next uh, uh, 90 minutes, you can find the wor uh, work online and most of the work is published. So deep learning at uh, UTRC. Uh, we were lucky to have uh, Jeff Hinton students by, uh, student by name Navadeep Jetli working with us in 2014. So we had a really good kickstart, uh, uh, and we had we were able to get up to speed uh, uh, with respect to deep learning in uh, 2014, and that has helped us a lot. And since then, we have been following the trend of machine learning, and uh, each way we try to find uh, business unit relevant applications. So the thing with uh, United Technologies and its huge business units uh, portfolio is we have all kinds of data starting from videos, transactional data, access control, and flight data, uh, uh, temporal data, lo uh, geographical location data, and social media data. So at that point in time, in 2014, deep learning showed a lot of promise. Uh, so, and, uh, and the other thing on the other, uh, other side is the things that we would like to solve, uh, simple things like anomaly detection, regression, and things like that. But right now, we are even looking into human in the loop and uh, generative models and things like that. So you can see that we are basically following the trend of deep learning uh, uh, work that's happening out, outside. So in 2014, when we started, uh, we basically had these four building blocks, right? Uh, convolution autoencoders and deep autoencoders. I really like autoencoders because it's completely unsupervised. Uh, we also had CNNs and DBNs, which are basically used for classification or regression kind of approaches. On top of that, in 2015, recurring neural nets, which can actually solve sequential decision making. And the core things can solve all these things, like classification, clustering, feature extraction, things like that. 2016, uh, one of my favorite topics, which is deep reinforcement learning, uh, uh, can be used to do actual learning, controls, human in the loop kind of uh, applications. And uh, recently, last year, most of our uh, focus was on uh, generative adversarial networks because you cannot deny the trend in deep learning. You just have to follow it. Uh, but uh, I'll show you some cool examples. The thing is, this, this is things are very intuitive, but how do they fit for uh, aerospace industry, if you will? Uh, where safety is very important. You need guarantees, you need all sorts of things. You need certification and things like that. So how can we use deep learning is the big question. So that said, I, I guess most of you know what this is, but um, just for sake of it, I'll go through this and I, we, I'll show you uh, different applications where we have used uh, deep auto encoders. So basically the idea is you give an input and you try to reconstruct the input and you try, you keep squeezing the bottleneck layer, and you make sure the reconstruction is really good. So you have a really good representation here, right? So uh, I cannot show you the actual data from the aircraft, so uh, the data that you're seeing is from a NASA database, uh, where the input is time series, it's close to 12 or 13 sensors, that go into the deep auto encoder, and we squeeze the bottleneck layer in such a way that I should be able to reconstruct the data. So how can we use this, right? So if, if, there is, if, if I have a sensor that's broken, I cannot reconstruct the data for that particular sensor. So I can also see which sensor I was unable to reconstruct, and I can say which sensor is bro broken. I mean, if you remember the disaster of Air France in uh, three or four years back, the ice sensor got, was broken and the pilot wasn't getting the right uh, reading. So you can basically use this as a virtual sensor, and it can actually tell you which sensor is broken, and you can, you can, you can decide not to rely on it, right? So the other thing is we build a lot of jet engines, and most of the time they are healthy. So the data that we have in our systems are from healthy engines. So if I learn an autoencoder using healthy engines, uh, 
say after a uh, thousand cycles, meaning the usage, uh, I'm sure I'm not able to reconstruct the exact signal. So the amount of data that I'm unable to reconstruct indicates the health of the engine, the degradation of the health. So there are man many ways you can actually use uh, autoencoders. So, and in this case, in the particular in the NASA data set, the center is when uh, I run uh, a test data set which, is no which has a nominal behavior through this network and these are the sensors that I'm looking for the reconstruction error and the re reconstruction error, error is pretty low. So can we use this output to do classification? You can actually do that. So the second spider chart that you're looking here is fault one, the other one is fault two, and the other one is fault three. By studying the reconstruction error for each sensor, uh, you can actually understand what kind of fault it is. Uh, and we just uh, did PCA and you can easily see this, uh, how well they are separated in the, uh, the two-dimensional space. So very quickly, I would like to go over what we have done uh, in, from 2014 to 16, just to give you some sense on what kind of applications uh, we have in aerospace and building systems. Uh, I'd like to start with something uh, and the guy there is my colleague. He is so happy that that was the first time he got out and uh, we went to the field and we wanted to test an escalator. And they said there is a casino next door and you can go and test the escalators there. So he was super happy and we had a nice time there. But the, 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 the thing is, whenever an escalator or an elevator is broken, we get a call from the building owner saying it's broken. So we send a technician Technician, basically, if it is an elevator, they take a ride and they feel how it is behaving and then they fix it. Same thing with the escalator. They take the ride and they feel the vibrations and these guys are really good. I mean, just by feeling the vibrations, they can understand exactly what component is broken and they can fix it. So what we decided to do is, why don't we use the cell phone that we have, which has close to 14, 15 different sensors, and uh, let's not use any uh, domain knowledge and just use all the sensors and see what we can do and can we detect uh, the door falls in an elevator or uh, the other thing is, uh, is the escalator healthy or not? So we built an app and surprisingly the results were really good. And just to, just to make sure if everything is working fine, uh, one of the fellow in the research center said, let's induce a fault which really doesn't have any vibration. So he, while we are collecting the data, he tried to stop the elevator door, and we were able to detect it. And the reason why we were able to detect it is the phone has a magnetometer and the door is made of steel, and it identified the pattern, and it was unable to reconstruct, and it raised an alarm, right? So if I was a subject matter expert, and if I have to design a machine learning algorithm and extract the features, I would never consider a magnetometer, right? So, so deep learning has a lot of advantages, meaning you, it's, a, it's a black box, but you dump the data and you can make sense of it. It's not that easy, but yeah, pretty close. Uh, the same thing that you have seen in the previous slide. Uh, let me st tell you the actual uh, use cases that we had for this. We used to own uh, Sikorsky helicopters, which, is, uh, which builds Black Hawk helicopters. So uh, they sell the helicopters and the contract is based on how they use it but the customer doesn't want to give you the GPS location. And the kind of contracts that we have is, uh, if the customer uses it for offshore, it's, the contract is more expensive. But we can never validate this thing. So we actually use the data acquisition boxes on the helicopter to understand what kind of uh, regimes that they are flying in. So we understand, without the GPS coordinates, we can understand what kind of missions that they are using the helicopter for. Appropriately, we can actually uh, tweak the contracts uh, on how they're using it. Uh, and the other uh, use case that we use this approach for is for inlet debris. So when the aircraft is uh, on the ground, the engine starts, and there are high chances that the, some of the metal particles would go into the engine. And if that happens, if the object is large, we have to get, get each and every blade inspected. So they have a really good sensor to sense this thing, but uh, these events are so small, they happen in fraction of a second. 
uh, we were able to use autoencoders to detect these uh, variations in the data. The, the third one is uh, structural characterization. So um, we build a lot of uh, composite materials. So the way they test the properties of the composite material is they do this pinch test and they try to measure the cracks. And these cracks are very fine. And people who work in biomedical imaging, they can appreciate how difficult it is to uh, detect and track these cracks. So not surprisingly, I again used autoencoders. And here the autoencoders were trained on images that don't have cracks. And when I run an image with cracks, I have huge reconstruction error wherever I see cracks. And on top of that, I used some work that I did during my PhD for image segmentation, tumor uh, detection. And uh, yeah, we had pretty good results, very similar to what a human uh, uh, technician can actually provide us. Um, this is here we tried to come up with a virtual uh, fuel flow rate sensor for a jet engine. So given the aircraft altitude, speed, and all the other nine other sensors, can I actually estimate what the fuel flow rate is? As I said before, if I am deviating from the fuel flow rate actual measurement, it kind of indicates that uh, my engine is not healthy, right? So that's uh, some results on that. And we also used it to uh, predict uh, uh, power consumption for a chiller unit, uh, which is an HVAC unit. This is a very interesting work that we have done, which is mental workload level uh, 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 estimation. So we design a lot of user interfaces. So when we design a new interf user interface, we would like to see if there is, if we reduce the workload levels of the user, right? So one way that we try to do this is once we expose them to two different user interfaces and then we give them a questionnaire, right? Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can hook them with the EEG sensors and you can measure their workload levels and attention levels and there are commercial softwares that can do that. Uh, but you have to know which user interface the user is using and things like that. Imagine that you are trying to change the user interface in a cockpit. It's a very complex environment. You have a lot of things going on. The input modality is not just visual, it's audio and a lot of other things. And uh, imagine saying the pilot that you can just do this for five minutes and immediately you have to change to something else. No, he is going to do whatever he can do to keep the flight flying, right? Uh, the challenge here is I have so many user interfaces and I'm not changing the entire thing at the same time. I'm changing parts of it. So I really need to understand what user interface or the sensors that the user is actually using. So we used uh, the, uh, deep learning uh, to actually segment the data. Uh, and the, uh, segment the data in the sense we were able to classify the data uh, to the extent that is the user watching, looking at, uh, looking at the screen? Is the user listening? What sensor is the user actually using? So the good thing about this uh, thing is you can let the pilot fly the way they want to and do whatever they want to. But we have a layer of algorithm that can actually segment the data. And we have a third party algorithm that can actually give you the workload levels and attention levels. Now you can easily identify the changes that you did in your user interface and measure what the workload and attention levels are. And one interesting thing that happened when we did that uh, uh, work was uh, whenever you hook a person to an EEG, you have to collect a baseline. And the baseline is valid only for six months. After that, you have to change the baseline. And you use the baseline to normalize the data. Uh, the deep learning was so good at extracting the features that we really don't need a baseline. So uh, that's something that, uh, that was that's mentioned in the paper too. As I said, we also have a business unit that uh, uh, has access control, like uh, swipe. Uh, where, whenever you go into your office, you swipe your badge, right? Um, so we, we used actually RNNs to predict where the user is going to swipe next. So how can we use this, right, as a company? We know exactly where the people would be, and if we want to fix a badge reader, we can, uh, to reduce the impact for the building uh, users, we can identify a time when there is less traffic. 
If the building owner wants to uh, organize an event, they, we can give them uh, simulated data on uh, what the crowd would be at any given location. So we also did a lot of work in computer vision. Uh, so this is, um, uh, we try to register uh, two different sensors. Uh, one is uh, RGB camera and the other one is LiDAR. So the biggest assumption is we assume that uh, both the sensors are aligned and we can move forward and then you, you process the data. But in many cases, we, we also pro uh, provide services to defense uh, uh, military applications. So when the things are moving, the sensors move and not, most of the time they're not aligned. And you're, you're assuming that they're aligned and you're trying to make decisions. So we, we used deep learning approaches to align the sensors uh, so that uh, you can do further uh, perception. Uh, you can use the traditional perception modules uh, after that. The other one is occlusion edge detection. Uh, I guess most of you know the difference between edge and an occlusion edge, right? Occlusion edge is something that you can navigate around, which is very important for uh, autonomous navigation. Whereas edge, you cannot navigate around, right? but they look very similar uh, in an image. So uh, we try to uh, teach a CNN on how to classify uh, occlusion edges and the normal edges. Uh, the other one, uh, the boroscope crack uh, detection. So when you're flying an aircraft and if the pilot thinks there is a bird hit to the engine, uh, once they land, each and every blade has to be inspected uh, by a, a technician. And they send a boroscope inside the engine and they spend close to six hours uh, inspecting the blade. And it's a slow process and it's a very expensive process. I mean, the aircraft has to sit there for six or seven hours. It's very expensive to the company. Uh, so what we did is, as you can guess, we, can, we used uh, CNNs uh, to actually do the boroscope detection. The results are shown there. And the red one is the ground truth. The last one, uh, very interesting topic. I'll get into the details. Uh, actually, Amit was planning to go into the details of the cold spread to manufacturing uh, use case, where we actually use deep reinforcement learning. So I'll get to that use case towards the end. So that's what we have been doing uh, till 2016. And uh, each time, uh, our business units come to us, uh, the first question that we used to ask is, do you guys have label data? And the first answer is no. And we're like, okay, bye. I mean, we, we, we couldn't solve their problems. So after two to three years, we realized that this is a serious problem because we have lots of data. I mean, without knowing, we collected a lot of data. So uh, how, we, we cannot expect the technicians to spend hours and hours to label this data. So we started focusing on data efficient machine learning algorithms. So mostly in 2014, and luckily there are these new things that were evolving in the, uh, the literature that we were able to actually use. So as I say here, label data is very expensive and in some cases it really don't exist. Like uh, a failed engine maybe two or three, but we don't, we need lots of engine failures if you want to train a machine learning algorithm, which is not possible, right? So these are expensive engines. Uh, so these are the three questions that we try to ask. Can we actually mimic the subject matter expert? Across UTC business units, there are so many subject matter experts who do a lot of visual inspection and things like this. So can we use the subject matter expert to and learn from them and mimic them in the computer vision algorithms, if you will. The other one is, uh, we are really good in building physics-based models, very precise models for jet engines and uh, anything that we build, we first have uh, physics-based models. So can we use the data from the simulations uh, to learn the models and deploy them in the real world, right? But keep in mind that real world data is very different from the simulations. And we also have the test rigs where we throw things into the engine, we run tests, we have in uh, 30 floors elevator uh, hoistway where we drop the elevator cabs. Uh, all these experiments are prescribed in the sense every data point is labeled. We know exactly what experiment we are doing. This data is labeled. Can we use this data to uh, build models and deploy them in real world? 
The answer is yes, uh, and we call this thing as data efficient machine learning. The first one is adversarial learning. Like you have two models fighting against each other and they learn and get better. I'll get into the details. And the other one is transfer learning. If I, can I learn the models in a data rich environment and deploy them in data poor environments? And reinforcement learning, uh, which co is completely based on a reward function and the algorithms can act in an environment, learn and update the models. So I'll go over these three uh, flavors of uh, techniques. I, I, know, I guess most of you know what adversarial learning is. Just for the sake of completeness, I'll go through this uh, thing. Uh, so you have a generator whose job is to generate realistic looking images, right? And you have a detective, and given an image, its job is to detect uh, fake images. And the detective has access to a real database, right? So if a detective detects a fake image, that information is back propagated to the generator. And now the generator has to get better in generating realistic images. As the generator gets better, the detective has to improvise. And now they have to even find, identify these minute differences uh, to detect differentiate between fake and And if you let them play this game for a while, uh, they'll reach an equilibrium. And uh, you can use generator for certain things. You can use detective for the other things, so on and so forth. Right? How, does, how, how is this used? I mean, when I show these slides to our executors, they laugh at it. I mean, I mean how can we use this for uh, aerospace and building systems, right? So how did we use it? The, the image that you're looking here uh, is uh, uh, a, a blade which is made of uh, titanium alloy. Uh, you're looking at it under a microscope. And the, job of the and, uh, the job of the technician is to measure the grain size. And the grain size is directly proportional to the tensile properties of the blade, of the material, if you will. And the, uh, this is not the actual size. The image is 10 times bigger than this. And it roughly takes 20 minutes in spite of using computer vision algorithms. So the first step is a computer vision algorithm does, does the uh, basic segmentation. And they, then they do the corrections. The challenge is the fine uh, gaps between the cells. It's hard for a computer vision algorithm to detect those gaps that differentiate that there are two grades. So right now, what we uh, they do is uh, this measure five images and it approximately takes two hours and this is the variance in the grain size which actually translates into the variance of the tensile property of the material but ideally they would like to measure close to 15 images which take nine hours uh, and the variance is less now they can estimate the tensile properties of the blade that goes into the jet engine more precisely but it takes nine hours so what we did is we tried to use generative adversarial networks. Uh, so the input, the input is the micro, uh, the image under the microscope, and the output is the segmented image. And the number of samples that we used is 1,500. The good thing about GANs is it generates the negative uh, examples. So it's pretty much data efficient. It generates its own negative examples. And uh, the generator can actually get better while the, uh, with the help of the discriminator. And as uh, the business value is, we can do this in less than a minute and we save a lot of time and money. Uh, this is, so were we able to use GANs right out of the uh, internet, right? No, not really. Things really didn't work the way we were expecting. So we had to improvise, uh, I mean, not significant changes, but uh, some changes that actually impact the results uh, significantly. So we call this as dual GAN. Um, we had to gen use a GAN, which actually generates uh, a blob. And we had a different GAN, which actually generates the contour of the uh, segment, of the grain that you're looking at. And then we had to do post-fusion post to segment the grains and then measure the grains. And we were very close to the results that the technician was getting, very close to the results. And uh, without this minor tweak, it's a very minor tweak. I mean, uh, uh, the results were way off. And uh, uh, the, I mean, if we stopped there, we wouldn't have used uh, this. This saves a lot of time, a lot of money. And uh, it's, it's, it doesn't take much, uh, I mean, 
you, you, you can easily automate this process within the microscope. You have a microscope, it segments, it measures the grain, it gives you the tensile property. Typically, this takes a lot of time. The same GANs we actually used as a virtual sensor. So the idea here is, uh, let me go with the first example. If I give you an RGB image, can you generate a depth image? So these are basically conditional GANs, right? Basically, I'm conditioning it on an RGB image, and can it generate a depth image? Uh, the images that you're looking here are from a Ford data set, which is publicly available, and this is from a LiDAR. So RGB sensors are cheap, and you can get 50 frames per second, right? Uh, LiDARs are very expensive. Mag, the best LiDAR would, uh, would, 50, uh, would be like uh, 15 frames per second. Uh, RGB, you can get 90 frames per second, right? So LiDAR, the best is 15 frames per second, and it's very expensive. So if I do this job properly, I can have a virtual LiDAR, which is 90 frames per second, which is physically not possible, right? Um, so uh, that's one thing that we try to use GANs for, and I'll go into the details. And the other thing is we have a business unit, which is UTAS, uh, United Technologies Aerospace. They build hyperspectral imaging for uh, uh, military applications. So what we did is instead of scanning all the wavelengths, can we scan few wavelengths and try to reconstruct the other wavelengths using GANs? Uh, so let me go into the details of the first one. And as you can guess, just giving a single frame, the reconstruction of the depth was really bad. So we had to give two frames, and we also had to augment it with optical flow to get really good results. And these are comparing with the standard uh, data set that people normally use, which is NYU depth V2 data set. And we are pretty close to the state of the art. Uh, I, this, I think this is published, this was published last year, I believe. Uh, and you can see the things. Uh, the funny thing is, uh, there was a frame where uh, in front of the camera there was a big bush, and uh, it kind of tried to build a car out of it. So, <laughs> so these are very dangerous things too, right? I mean, you, you literally cannot do any verification and validations of this algorithms. So I cannot give this to Utah's and tell just use it. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of work that's needed. That's exactly the f uh, focus that we are, that's the focus, uh, that's the things that we are focusing on in 2018 this year. Uh, it's basically verification and validation of uh, machine learning algorithms. And I don't know if you guys are aware of uh, explainable AI, a DARPA program. There is a lot of work that's ha happening there uh, regarding these things. Uh, so. The other one is uh, the hyperspectral imaging. So this is RGB channels. And this is uh, the reconstruction if I just give you RGB. And the other wave wavelengths that we are uh, recreating are never seen before. So the results are really bad. Uh, the attempt here is I'll give you an RGB and you'll have a half a million hyperspectral sensor. Uh, yeah, you cannot do that good, but uh, by, red, by giving few wavelengths, like in this case, we gave six wavelengths uh, from a hyperspectral image in addition to RGB, and we were able to reconstruct the 31 uh, wavelengths that were not measured from, from the sensor. Uh, moving to the next one, transfer learning. Uh, very intuitively, right? If I teach you how to throw a ball, you are supposed to capture that knowledge, and you should quickly learn how to throw a basketball. That's the analogy, right? So how does this apply to our companies, which is mostly in uh, aerospace and building systems? So these are the new products that we are releasing, the next-gen engines, the next-gen elevators. And we hardly have any data from these engines, and we have never seen failure modes in this uh, next-gen uh, things that we are uh, producing, right? So how can we train a machine learning algorithm? So we, this is, that's the data poor environment. And we have a data rich environment, which is uh, test rigs, as I said, and test towers, where we do a lot of experiments. We have simulations. We have uh, very precise physics-based simulations. We also have CAD models for everything that we build. And the most important thing is the legacy engines and legacy elevators. We have decades worth of uh, engine data and elevator data. 
but the sensors have changed, the free sampling rate have changed. But the question is how can we use? Because these legacy engines have seen all kinds of faults, which we even sometimes cannot recreate in the test rigs. So how can we use this kind of data, which is very valuable, and learn some models and transfer those models into data poor environments? So one thing that I can show you on in that regard is uh, object detection. So, so the idea here is whenever a technician goes on site to fix an elevator, uh, they see a part is broken and they have to order a part. If they make a mistake in ordering the part, uh, you guys would see work in progress for the next two, two weeks. So he has to be very precise. The problem with detecting the parts is this is a ro uh, roller guide and you can see uh, the details here, right? So there are 20 different roller guides with very subtle variations in this uh, uh, the design, very subtle variations. It's very hard for the human to understand what type it is. It's very easy for the technician to go there and say, yeah, this is roller guide and this is rail and things like that. That's not the problem here. The, the, the challenge is detecting the type of the roller guide and which is very difficult. It's very difficult even for the humans. Uh, you cannot find these images labeled in Google or, uh, on the web, right? I mean, many people, there are very few people who might like these images. So, so we cannot ask our technicians to start collecting the data and label this data. So we, and it's not easy for us to do an object detection on these objects. So what we did is every part that we build has a CAD model, very precise CAD model. So we use the CAD models and as you guys can guess, uh, once you have the CAD models, you can extract thousands of images with lighting variations, scale, rotation, anything, right? So you have a very rich data set, perfectly labeled, and can we train a model, object detection model, and deploy it in the real world? So we used an approach, uh, I mean the name sounds fancy, transfer learning and domain adaptation, but it's a very simple thing. We took both these modalities into a common space, which is edge space, where they actually look similar. So if I learn an um, object detection model in this space, which are the edges of the CAD model, I can actually detect the object uh, in, its, uh, in the environment. So how does it perform, right? So, so it's a virtual hoist way. We have an excellent HMI team which can spin up any uh, AR, VR stuff. So what you're seeing is virtual hoist way. And the object is, and you can see a circle whenever we detect the object. And it, it was pretty robust in occlusion. And we actually added occlusion and things like that when we extracted the synthetic data. And this work is not new. There, there are a lot of other uh, work in the literature that actually uh, uses this kind of approaches. Uh, and as I said before, that the goal is not to detect all the 10,000 parts that Otis has. When the technician goes to the field, we have a lot of context. So the context actually narrows down into very spare, like 10 or 15 different objects. So whenever they approach there, we will have a customized model so that the, the detection can be precise. And this model cannot detect cats and dogs, right? It's very focused for the job that they're doing. Um, uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, yeah, I'll get to that in the next slide, but now, uh, okay. We use the same transfer learning approaches again for Otis elevators. So as I said before, the technician tries to feel the vibrations of the uh, elevator or the escalator to see what's wrong, right? We decided to add a sensor, uh, and we did a lot of testing in our Bristol test tower, where we, try, we tried different sensors and different fault types. We got excellent models. We can detect what kind of faults the door, is, uh, door has, really high accuracy. So we picked a place uh, in Orlando, Universal Studios to be precise, and we deployed the sensors, and the output was a disaster. You can guess Universal Studios, people are, going crazy, jumping up and down, nothing has worked. And we realized that um, we have to baseline those things and we actually use some pretty sophisticated techniques from transfer learning to actually align the models from the test tower to the field and uh, we were uh, able to do very good detection in the field. 
And the good thing about adding a sensor is uh, you can actually measure the degradation of the elevator. And we, you really don't have to wait until a building owner calls you saying that the elevator is broken. Every day we would get the me measurements from the sensor and uh, you can exactly monitor the degradation of the elevator. I mean, th this goes with aircraft engines or any of this uh, kind of systems that we build. And we can also actually do fault classification using these sensors. I'm intentionally not going into the details because I'm not allowed to. We use the same approaches, transfer learning approaches, uh, and uh, what you're seeing here is uh, we wanted a robotic arm that can grow, go and grasp a tool from a table. So the task here is the traditional approaches, you have to teach them. This is where you teach the robot with demonstration on how to grab, uh, gra gra grab an object, right? So what we did with our HMI team is we created a virtual environment and uh, we had that has a physics engine and we have all the tools and we asked one of our uh, colleagues to start picking the tools. And we gathered this data to understand what's the best grasp location for the grasper that we have. So this tr learning of the best grasp location for an object is completely learned from a virtual environment. So that's first one thing. And we went crazy and we also t wanted to do the object detection with the approach that we have used before, which is can we generate the training data set from the CAD models uh, of these tools that we have and uh, train an object detection algorithm. So the process goes like this and it has a depth uh, information to it. It's an RGBD camera. And uh, you have the depth information. We try to keep the experiment very simple. I mean, you can see they don't overlap and things like this. Uh, you can easily detect the object, put a bounding box, and you have the depth. You can easily identify the orientation. And we have a CNN, which was actually trained on a realistic looking CAD models. We asked our HMI team to add the color and texture to these objects, so we really don't have to fine tune it with uh, the real images. And this is how the real images look like. And we have a object detection, we know the location, we know the orientation. This commands are sent through ROS network to the uh, robotic arm, and it knows the orientation, it knows the grasp location from the previous line, and it uh, does the uh, job, right? So let's see how it uh, works in, So the perception pipeline and uh, the knowledge of best grasp location, everything was done from a virtual environment. Right. Yeah, I mean, we are a research center, so we can do fun stuff. I mean, these are not serious. <laughs> So uh, getting to reinforcement learning. Uh, unfortunately, Amit Surana couldn't be here. Uh, it would have been nice if he was presenting the slides uh, moving forward. Uh, I'll try my best to cover uh, what he wanted to present. Um, I mean, um, traditionally, we like to be in this loop where we expect a subject matter expert to label the data, right? Uh, and we learn from this labeled data. The good thing about uh, reinforcement learning in specific is you can actually act and learn from you the actions that you have made and learn from the consequences based on a reward function. And once in a while, you can query a subject matter expert and use that information to improve your performance. Uh, so we try to use this approach in additive manufacturing processes. So uh, how many of you know about additive manufacturing? Good. It's very similar to 3D printing, but here the printing is happening with metals. So we collaborated with um, our surface mechanics group, uh, Aaron, Adi, and Jason, and Matt, and who actually do the uh, a technique called cold spray. I mean, there are a lot of additive manufacturing processes like powder bed. You put powder and you use laser to heat the powder and you can build complex stuff. 
the, the one that I'll show you is a, a technique called cold spray. It's mostly used to refurbish the parts. Um, so, so the manufacturing industry is close to uh, uh, seven trillion dollars, I guess, but don't quote me on that. But one thing that I know is additive manufacturing business is just uh, uh, for seven billion dollars. But many people think that additive manufacturing or advanced manufacturing should change the future, but it has not done till date. And uh, the main reason for that is uh, any part that you build using additive manufacturing process, it's hard to do process qualification and even the part qualification. Because these are so complex things, it's close to impossible to repeat the same thing again and again. So what you're seeing here is uh, the places where you can actually use machine learning to improve the performance. And basically, the, uh, the, how can we do insert process monitoring and sensing to ra uh, increase the speed at which we uh, do the process qualification or the part qualification? Uh, so uh, let me show this additive manufacturing process is a highly nonlinear system. And it's very difficult to use controls, but we can use control theory and machine learning to add value to the additive manufacturing process towards uh, faster pa part qualification, right? So let's see an example. Uh, this is a process called uh, cold spray, where a metal is sprayed at high speeds, and uh, it actually sticks to the surface and it bonds. So this is a coupon, and the idea here is you want to fill this defect uh, using this process. A uh, couple of challenges with this process, right? So as I said, additive manufacturing, pro uh, the cold spray process is used to refurbish the parts. Meaning uh, if, if you have a wear and tear to your part, they send it to us and we have to finish it to the desired surface. The challenge is each time the initial condition is different. And you cannot have a predefined uh, path plan and you cannot repeat it. So each time, uh, the, we, it's a long process. Let me show you what the process is. So what you're seeing here is a bearing mount for a pump. And there is some wear and tear uh, at this location, right? So once we get this part, we build mock parts, which look similar to that. And we have people who try to spray different materials at different angles and all these other combinations and send it, send it to the labs and see if the quality of the, uh, the spray is good. And once this takes close to a month, and once they are happy, uh, they use that information to come up with a path planning just for that specific part, and they spray the material. And even when they do this job, they try to overspray and then machine it. So there is a lot of uh, material that's being wasted in this process. So being a machine learning and computer vision group, what we thought of doing is, can we actually sense the depth and uh, give it to a controller and try to, I mean, basically you're, you're uh, trying to do, uh, clo uh, do, uh, close the loop. And a uh, couple of things that you can use, right? You can use iterative learning controls or model predictive controls. But the most promising thing is uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, let me go into the details of that. Just to give you some background, if you end up using control theory, it's a very general approach, which is really good, but there is no learning happening. Each time you have to solve a new problem, you have, each time you have to apply it for a new surface, you have to solve this problem again. And it's, it's not real-time because you cannot do real-time optimization in this space. Reinforcement learning, it actually learns and it also generalizes, but the challenge is here you have to handcraft the features and you have to make sure the state space is small. Uh, which is not possible when you are putting a camera as an input sensor. It's, you, it's an infinite space. So deep learning has really good things, right? It's state-of-the-art results uh, for classification. It eliminates hand-designed features, but it needs large amounts of data. You can fill this gap using reinforcement learning in, in a simulation. So how do we do this, right? So the idea is, uh, to, going back to deep reinforcement learning, you have different flavors. So the idea is you sense, you have a perception layer, you have a policy, and you have the actuators on how the additive manufacturing process should happen. 
So one place where you can use machine learning is if you have a camera, you can take the feed and uh, extract features and give it to the controls. The other way is you can actually use machine learning to find, uh, to learn the value function and the policies uh, in a reinforcement learning framework. What Google has done uh, four years back or three years back is an end-to-end -end perception to learn uh, for learning and control, which is the playing the Atari games. And they also use this approach for playing the Go game. So the idea is you sense, for you just short circuit the controls, you act. You sense and you act in real time. So we looked into this work and we thought this is something that can actually help us uh, in the additive manufacturing process. So what's happening here is uh, we placed a sensor in the booth, which is a line scanner, which gives us the precise depth of the uh, coupon that we are working on. And uh, we can do state space estimation and then the con control to compute. But we want to get rid of those things and just use a deeply connected network to do the job. So the input to the network would be the sensor data, which is the depth information. And the output would be the speed at which the nozzle is supposed to move. Right now, we have a model which can just control the speed at which it moves. We can also have a model which can uh, in, in addition to the speed, it can also control the angle. Because uh, if the spray is perpendicular to the surface, the bond is really good. Um, so yeah, the inspiration is from the work that Google DeepMind has done. And uh, even few people, uh, Peter Abiel from uh, UC Berkeley, uh, have also looked into these approaches. So. Uh, that the challenge with reinforcement learning is I have this in a simulated environment. Now I should let my algorithm play as much as it can and learn from it. I cannot let uh, the algorithm play in the booth. This, these things are very expensive. And the, the, the helium gas and the materials that we are using is expensive. So we go to the simulated environment where we have physics-based simulations and we try to play it as a game and the reward function is it should get the uh, finished, the finished surface should be smooth. So that's the reward. And if it achieves it, it gets the reward. Uh, so how, and if I let, this, let it play in the simulation, it will take forever because it's totally doing exploration. I need to give it some promising paths which it can actually exploit instead of just exploring for like months, right? So one way we can do it is you, we can use uh, local optimal controls to give some promising trajectories. And uh, you can train on this data, uh, which is not closed. The other thing is you can, again, use local uh, optimal control and uh, get the output from the uh, model to see what the parameters are and how the performance is, which is a closed loop. The idea here is you have a teacher that's trying to teach you. And the teacher here is control. So we take all the uh, information, all the uh, uh, algorithms from the controls, which is uh, uh, model predictive control, and uh, we used it as a teacher for the deep learning model to explore the space, uh, basically explore the promising space. So this is a lot more detail, but the idea here is we have a controller which gives you the local local controls, and we want a deep learning algorithm that can use this local information come and come up with a uh, global controller. So uh, just to show you how complex this uh, process is, the cold spray process, um, it's a highly nonlinear problem. And it has uh, things like the particle distribution and deposition efficiency and the position of the nozzle, how far it is from the surface. It's a very complex uh, uh, problem. And it's not easy to model these things even. And we are not even coupling it, it with the thermal thermodynamics of the materials and the temperature and things like that. So it's, it's a very basic uh, model that we have. And we discretize, discretize it, and we try to uh, so let me show you a simulation on how, what the output would be from that. But it is a very approximate version of uh, what the real process is. So that's the nozzle. That's, that's what's being sprayed. And red is the initial surface. And that, that's the deposition that's happening. And uh, that, is, uh, being, that was built based on this model that we have. So um, as I said, uh, 
couple of things that we can do is if someone gives me a state space, I can replace it with a deep network. So I really don't need to do a real time uh, model predictive control optimization each time I have it. But the good thing is we also replaced using the deep reinforcement learning that it actually gives me the state space and it does the, uh, it also gives me the output uh, that the actuator has to feed onto. And you can see the results. Uh, the model predictive control was the teacher teaching the deep neural network. And you can see they are pretty close. The performance of them is pretty close. Um, let me show you some examples. And uh, whenever you get these parts, you actually finish it, then you, and then you apply this process of cold spray, right? Uh, I'll just run one example. Uh, on the left, it's constant speed, so you will see the same surface profile building up. Uh, on the right uh, is while you use a model that was learned using deep reinforcement learning. So basically the idea is if it is too deep, you slow down, spray, and keep moving. And you can see the speed of the nozzle is changing. And uh, when we did the learning, the learning was done on only one, one defect, and it was, it was pretty good in generalizing on two uh, defects that we have there. So this was done in 2016, and when we showed these results to the other department or other people, no one bought it. So we said we will show it on a real system in 2017, and which we did. Uh, and this was uh, basically the question was from, uh, as I said, we actually work with uh, DARPA and other government agencies, and we were trying to sell this concept, and they didn't buy it. So how did we do that? So we took it for real. Uh, it was a painful process, but uh, we have a line scanner. We have a coupon. Uh, it's connected to the MATLAB where the simulations happen, uh, and the model is there. And uh, we go back and control the ABB robot, the speed at which the nozzle moves. So there are a couple of challenges here when you go into the real environment. The biggest challenge is model calibration. The, the, uh, the model that we had for the simulations is not the way the real system moves. So we had to collect some sample data and use nonlinear optimization to optimize for the parameters like the spray uh, efficiency and things like that. And that's the biggest challenge that we had. And uh, we got really good parameter estimations, which actually simulated the actual real process. So once the calibration phase is done, uh, the learning phase, the same thing that I explained before, and the biggest challenge was with the deployment, the speed and the way the ro ABB robot moves and things like that. So one thing that we realized while doing this process, the biggest problem with most of the machine learning algorithms is the output was not bounded. So the maximum speed that I can move, uh, go with this ABB robot is five, but I cannot control this from uh, on the machine learning model. It can give me any value. And if it gives me any value, I'm literally, yeah, it's not, it's going to be bad. And these are very expensive machines. Uh, uh, so what we did is uh, we basically capped it, uh, very simple way, but we are actually working on to incorporate constraints into the machine learning model while learning. Um, so how would it look like? So this is the coupon. This is a constant speed. We just sprayed it with constant speed. Uh, this is using deep reinforcement learning. And this is using varying speed. So say you have a human expert who saw this profile and they say that since you have it de more depth here, go fast and then go slow and go fast. So we had an algorithm that actually does that, which is the varying speed from the expert. And uh, keep in mind that there is no feedback. Once they start running this experiment, there is no feedback and, it, and the error keeps building, as you can see here. So this is the output from the deep reinforcement learning framework. So each pass, meaning each build, the, the prescribed output actually changes, which is the speed at which it should move. You can see fast and then slow and fast. And as it builds, it makes sure you get a uh, smooth finish. So as I said, in additive manufacturing process, uh, scrap is the biggest issue. We waste a lot of uh, material uh, by just spraying and then finishing it. So compared to constant speed, we were able to save 16%. 
and compared to varying speed we were able to save uh, 35% and the biggest challenge here for us was uh, the ABB robot doesn't behave the way we want it to and it's it's a black box for us so you can give the waypoints and tell it to go at, at certain speeds but it changes the speed so that it can reach the waypoint in at certain uh, speeds that it wants to so uh, unless you have a feedback you really cannot come up with a better uh, spray here so let me show you actually this is my last slide so you'll get 30 minutes uh, So that's the laser, and this is the output of the, uh, the thing that I'm sensing. And this is the speed that was prescribed by the machine learning model. And so it's going smooth, and this is the first pass. And you can see the recommended profile for the speed has changed for the second pass. And we, since we have a lot of time, we can go through all the 100 passes one by one. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so that's the third pass, and that's the last one, I promise. But yeah. So you can see how much material is being deposited. So, and I'll jump to 40. Sorry, it's still four. And uh, you can see the speed profile, the output from the machine learning model. Go fast, slow, and fast. Ah, there you go. So this is the build that has happened till now. And based on this information, the model prescribed that it sh the, the nozzle should be moving at this speed. Right. So <laughs> the, the, the point is, um, UTC as a company is under this uh, digital transformation. I mean, we talk about digital twin, digital thread, and all these other fancy things, right? But the, the challenge is the UTC business units have unique challenges. And as a research center, we try to do research to solve those problems. So as I said, we were focusing on data efficient machine learning algorithms. But the work that we are doing right now in 2018 is how can we bring, bring the physics-based models into the machine learning framework? And how can we actually add constraints into the machine learning framework? As an example, the, the, uh, the image characterization that I showed you where I measured the grain size, uh, by the manufacturing process, you can guarantee that the size of the grain shouldn't exit, uh, exceed certain size. So if I can give this information to the machine learning model, I would never have a big grain, right? Uh, so these are the things that we are uh, actually working on. Hopefully, we'll be publishing all the work that's happening under these two areas uh, uh, this year. And uh, yeah, that's what I have. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Yes. Please. Um, I'm curious, how do you choose the cases that you're working on? Come again? So we work very closely with the business unit. So as a stru the, the, stru the structure of research center is we have a program office for each business unit. And they have staff, and their only job is to connect the researchers with the business unit problems. So they spend half their time with the business units and half their time with the research center. And that's the only way we can stay relevant. I mean, if not, we'll be doing crazy things which really don't make sense to the business units. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, please. So I see a lot of uh, uh, IoT-based work that was done. Mm -hmm. So how, how did that pipeline work? So do you have like a standard technology stack that you use in general to deploy most of the solutions? Yes, uh, so each business unit tries to do tries to come up with their own technology stack, which is not public, so I cannot go into the details. But Pratt & Whitney, they have their own technology stack. Pratt & Whitney also has military engines. So there are certain requirements from the government. Uh, so we cannot use all the technology stacks that are available out there, and not all the cl cl cloud providers, if you will. So we have our own restrictions. And Otis has its own technology stack. 
but we try to stay up to date and uh, one of the uh, role of the research center is we have a group the systems uh, a group which whose job is to make sure we are up to date with these things and we try to recommend our business units on market yes yeah. oh sorry yeah So we, uh, the first question, good question, every good question has no answer. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so the question is, uh, uh, how many of our products actually use the research that we have done? Aerospace, nothing panned out because they need verification and validation of everything that we do. And these things are literally black boxes. And uh, that's the reason why this year, our main focus is on verification and validation of machine learning models. It's not just deep learning, but uh, they need guarantees if they want to put it in an aircraft. Um, so, but we had good success with the commercial side. Uh, the second question that you asked is how much of fine tuning that we need to do when it goes into the field. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yes. So that's a nice question, not a good question, but nice question. So I'll definitely answer it. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a very, very important question when you talk about deploying machine learning models for your products. The biggest challenge is the first batch of machine learning models that we provide has certain features which would be impacted by using the machine learning model in the field. Uh, uh, I'm unable to go into detail, I'll, I'll try to find an analogy for that. I mean, you might use a feature that might not exist or might be affected once you apply your deep learning model because once you use your deep learning model, you are actually affecting the environment that it, from which you are gathering the data. So these features actually will become irrelevant after a while and you have to keep updating your models and we are struggling, okay, so. It's not an easy job. I, the, this is called model drift, right? I mean, uh, doing model drift is a very challenging problem. You, n you can do simple things like you can see the distribution of your data and see, yeah, this is the time I need to change my models and it's time to update my models. But yeah, it's, it's a challenging job. Yes. Sorry, yeah, I, sorry. So, most of the business units are. Uh, so, the question is uh, when we try to give machine learning models and the solutions based on machine learning models, the customer might not be willing to adapt completely. So, can we support them partially? Um, close, right? Close enough? Yeah. So, it is a challenge. I mean, uh, this. On the production line, it's a serious business. And uh, not in research centers, right? I mean, it's, it's mostly fun in research centers. And uh, for production line, it's serious. I mean, you cannot just ask them to switch things and say, just believe me and trust my algorithm and it's going to work. So we are actually taking the same approach that you suggested uh, in which we do incremental changes. Not end to end, but can you put sensors in your booth so that at least uh, the good thing about that is, I mean, we are not influencing your process. Just put the sensors. And the good thing is we are gathering data. And we, we gather the data and we do show them in simulations that if you have used our algorithms, they might be using their uh, own quality process, right? They might be doing tensile testing and things like that. And they have real evidence based on the process parameters that they have been using. The good thing is we have already placed our sensors. So we have the sensor data. We can run our machine learning algorithms and show them that we were able to detect the faults that you, have, you detected during your process. So you have to build that relationship and you have to, they have to trust us basically. And it's a, uh, it's a slow process. Yes, please. Uh, I have injured temperature data. Mm -hmm.
where my uh, interest came, you know, like plotting 120 degrees just for a couple of times or uh, being more than 100 degrees for three days. And my thoughts are like some are like, like Antarctica and uh, at times it, it is like some days in the Florida, you know, which is pretty warm. Yeah. So, uh, um, they have state-of-the-art models for Pratt & Whitney jet engines. Uh, they can actually simulate uh, the temperature effects because they go at really high temperatures and they can actually predict uh, what the microstructure would be after exposed to certain temperature. So they have models and I, I don't have a solution of machine learning for that. But we are actually using, planning to use those machine learning models to avoid putting the things under microscope and just take the operation conditions and can we predict the quality of the blade. Like right now I'm using APIs, mm -hmm. uh, which gives me the major data for just particularly that thing. Mm -hmm. And that quite different in a month. But then still it's not working. Yeah, I, I, I cannot comment on the specifics. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yes, please. No, privacy reasons, we don't tap into anyone's phones, uh, but uh, we are actually, for us, the crowd is the technicians. So Otis has close to 20,000 uh, technicians uh, servicing uh, close to 100,000 uh, uh, elevators all over the world. So we try to source the data, all the data goes into a central location and we try to process that data. Yes. Yeah, yes. 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 So, so the key in auto encoders is uh, how much you can squeeze. So. Uh, the bottleneck layer so that the required information is passed through the autoencoder, right? So, and it's easy to get, gather lots of data from healthy equipment that you have. And if you learn an autoencoder that way, and if there is any deviation from the nominal behavior, uh, the autoencoder cannot reconstruct. Because since you squeezed, it's actually relying on other correlations and other sensors to build each specific sensor. So now, we, since the distribution has changed, it basically cannot reconstruct certain sensors. Uh, if, if it is the health of the engine that's degrading, that impact would be on all the sensors that you're recreating. If it is a failed sensor, it might be accumulated across just one sensor, things like that. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, a lot. Uh, the, we, uh, the HVAC system uh, mostly is, uh, has a lot of sensors. The entire building has sensors. And we also have access to uh, outside temperature and things like this. So we do that on a day-to-day -day basis and it's basically using controls, not really machine learning. Yeah. So, uh, so do we use uh, machine learning to optimize the HVAC systems? The, yeah, sorry. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, buildings is a, not a critical infrastructure, right? I mean, aircraft, I cannot. They won't let me do it. But buildings, you can. I mean, you can easily replace the physical sensors to reduce the cost if they have uh, required uh, performance. It's a low risk, basically. So it can be done. but. Uh, we are not doing it right now. Yes, please. Um, you have an example about uh, there's a there's a sensor that you work with, and you're using deep learning to identify a, a certain sensor needs. Uh, so, this, what is the best time? Yes. Uh, so that we 
Yes. question so uh, the thing is the traffic in the building depends on outside weather so if you're going to lunch if the weather is really good people try to go outside and it also depends on the day of the time and you you can make an argument that you can just get some simple distributions and you can actually simulate everything but looking at the data it's not that simple so for some reason for some event that's happening in the conference room one the entire dynamics would change within the building. For, for the, mostly the biggest impact for us is the way the patterns, patterns in which the access read, readers, uh, the data at the access readers uh, distribution changes is because of the weather. So people try to go through the courtyard if it is good, uh, things like that. So the thing is we have access to all this information. So the question is can we do it better? You're right, you can get a decent performance uh, using very naive distribution analysis, but yeah, there, there might be no point using RNNs. Yeah, so what, is, what is the uh, approach that you think is not about? I'm pretty sure it's not about investing in the deep learning. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of other approaches that we use, uh, Bayesian networks, and a lot of other things. I mean, this is just, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, if we just bank on deep learning. Uh, yeah, we are dead. <laughs> Sorry. Do you guys already have plans to make these packages or like open source packages at some point? So, uh, it's a tough question to answer. So, we try to publish it and all the changes that we did through the publications. Uh, the issue is we, we are a defense contractors. So, the government has certain regulations on things that we can share. So not everything that we develop can be shared in public domain. Yes, please. Um, so you had mentioned um, uh, some slides that showed some material characterizations yes. from uh, Pratt & Whitney, and you tried microstructure segmentation to uh, determine, uh, I believe, uh, I guess the integrity of the material by grain size, et cetera. Yes. Um, is that application going to replace certain roles of actual human technicians uh, so the question is, uh, do, uh, using machine learning to do material characterization, would it replace actual humans? Uh, could it? Uh, the, the trick is, I mean, without the humans, we call them as subject matter experts. They are the one who provide us the labeled data to begin with, right? And the, the, the challenge that as a company that Pratt has is we have limited uh, subject matter experts. And it's not easy to come up with a subject matter expert in a day. And we have too many job, tasks to be done than the work that, the time that they have. So this kind of approaches can help free their time to do the other jobs. So right now it, we basically wait for the time to, so that they can do the analysis. Their yes. Fine yes. Yeah. To yes. Is and uh, the, the biggest thing that we always try to do is to have human in the loop because uh, you put it under the microscope, it can do the best job, and there is always a human, mostly in aerospace, there is always a human, and they get the best output from the algorithm, and they just have to spend one second if there is any some small correction and done. Right? And the correction that they're doing would be fed back into the machine learning algorithm to get better models. So next time the model is good in detecting. So it's a closed loop. I mean, it's, a, it's always human in the loop. Thanks. Okay. Yes, please. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, replacing the traditional control, control with machine learning or machine yes. learning. Yes. Uh, do you see that both that you could optimize the results uh, so yeah, my background is not in controls, but my understanding is that machine learning has extensively been used 
in controls, either to estimate the state space or uh, even uh, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, May, uh, the point is it has been used, but I, I exactly don't know the details where, details where it has been used. Yes. Yes, please. So, so you recently gave an answer that you were struggling with the deployment of models. Yes. Is Maintenance of, so that, that struggles in basically putting this machine learning models in the production line. Uh, the biggest struggle that we have is maintaining the machine learning models in the sense, when do we know that we have to change the machine learning model? So the, the follow-up question is, how do you match the life cycle of these models on the data that they produce? Do you have a life cycle management? Uh, we are not working at the research center on that as of now. But that's the biggest concern that we, that's the biggest concern that we have. As we start deploying things in the field, that's something that we are realizing that we need to find a solution for them. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thank you.